And uh, in the setting of uh, pulmonary embolism, there are some anatomic variants that uh, can be uh, important, uh, duplication of the IVC or SVC and or left-sided uh, SVC, IVC, or IVC interruption with azagous uh, continu continuation. The uh, blood then uh, enters the right atrium. Uh, the right atrium uh, is kind of a, a low uh, pressure system. Uh, and uh, within the uh, uh, atrium, uh, the blood then can pass through the uh, tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Uh, normally, unless it's a long-standing chronic pulmonary arterial hypertension situation such as CTEF, uh, the right atrium is not going to be enlarged, um, but uh, it can occur in the setting of right ventricular hypertrophy uh, secondary to tricuspid regurgitation. Other findings that you might see uh, from an imaging standpoint, it could be reflux of contrast into the uh, IVC or hepatic veins on imaging uh, in the workup of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension and dilated azagous or venous systems. Uh, blood then travels uh, through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. And uh, anatomically, uh, the right ventricle should be smaller than the left ventricle. So you can use that as a ratio uh, to sort of uh, identify whether you have uh, right uh, heart strain related to uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension and or uh, acute PE. Um, you try to measure this in the axial images that best approximate a four-chamber view. Uh, and you can see an elevation in the right atrial to left ventricular ratio uh, in acute and chronic pulmonary uh, hypertension situations. But the uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, which is really better assessed uh, by echocardiography, uh, is uh, really only going to be seen in chronic pulmonary hypertension and or CTEF. Um, another anatomic thing you can look at is the uh, interventricular septum. Uh, if it, it normally bows towards the uh, right uh, ventricle, uh, but can be flattened or paradoxically uh, uh, bowed towards the left ventricle in the setting of, of increased uh, right heart pressures. Uh, and from a pressure standpoint, the normal ventricular pressures uh, should be systolically 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury, and in a diastolic setting, about 1 to 8 millimeters of mercury. Uh, here are some examples of an uh, abnormal left ventricular to right ventricular ratio. Um, and, you know, that can be prognostic for patients. Uh, those, the patients that do have elevated RV-LV ratios have significantly elevated all-cause and PE-cause uh, mortality. Uh, and then uh, the image on the right is an example of paradoxical uh, bowing of the interventricular septum, both in the setting of acute PE, as you can see on the left image, where there's uh, highlighted in yellow is a, an acute pulmonary embolus. Blood then tra uh, tra uh, travels through the semilumeric valve to the pulmonary trunk. Uh, the normal pulmonary artery measures 2.5 to 2.9 centimeters in size, and that is, uh, has high positive uh, predictive value if it's greater than 2.9 centimeters in size for pulmonary arterial hypertension of any cause. Uh, a little more uh, specific is the pulmonary artery to aortic ratio. If that's less than one, uh, that also has high uh, positive predictive value and even higher specificity for pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension, uh, although with a caveat that in patients over 50 years of age, you, you have to be careful because it may be, um, the, if the aortic uh, aorta is abnormally large, it may be falsely low. Um, from a... Uh, uh, Pulmonary artery pressure standpoint, uh, when it's measured at, at cardiac cath, systolics in the 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury should be normal, diastolics 8 to 15, as well as a mean uh, pressure of 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. And the mean pulmonary pressure uh, is also prognostic, especially in patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, where uh, survi uh, one study showed that survival uh, in those with a mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 50 was uh, only 20% at two years. And another study said that the mean overall survival was only about 6.8 years uh, uh, with the similar uh, elevated pulmonary arterial pressures. Uh, examples of normal on the left and abnormal pulmonary artery to uh, uh, aortic ratios. Um, the, uh, additionally, uh, within the parenchyma itself, you can use the pulmonary artery to the adjacent bronchus as uh, the ratio of uh, uh, greater than one being abnormal and also suggestive of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The pulmonary trunk then branches into right and left pulmonary arteries. The normal sizes uh, are less than two centimeters in adults. 
Uh, and what's interesting, I guess, in chronic pulmonary thromboembolic hypertension is that you may have asymmetric enlargement of the right or left uh, pulmonary artery. Um, then uh, pulmonary artery wedge pressures are also obtained during the uh, assessment of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, and uh, they should be in the 2 to 15 millimeters of range. And in cases of uh, CTEF or pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary arterial wedge pressure, also known as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, may be difficult to uh, obtain, and so you may need to obtain left uh, ventricular end diastolic pressures in order to uh, complete the assessment of these patients. Um, the pulmonary circulation within the lungs itself uh, has a, a pretty uh, anatomy that's very similar to the bronchus, and I left this chart in here for your uh, perusal at some point in the future. But uh, the pulmonary arteries should be anatomically fairly smooth. They should taper normally within the parenchyma itself uh, and uh, should fill equally throughout uh, during uh, angiography. Uh, in the case on the uh, left, the, the, uh, the catheter is actually a little bit in the descending uh, branch of the pulmonary artery, which doesn't allow for uh, symmetric filling of the uh, upper lobe branches. Uh, but uh, the uh, artery should not have intraluminal filling defects or other um, uh, chain, abrupt changes in caliber or, or cutoffs, and uh, many of the other speakers are gonna discuss a lot more of the diagnostic elements of uh, pulmonary embolism. Here's the left-sided pulmonary angiograms, uh, again showing the uh, anatomic segments uh, within the uh, left side of the pulmonary artery. Uh, from acute pulmonary standpoint, uh, intraluminal filling defects, whether they're occlusive or non-occlusive are sort of the main uh, things that we look for. Uh, uh, you may have, uh, in large volume clot, you may get uh, expansion of the pulmonary artery as well, which may um, help you identify the clue. In chronic changes, anatomically, you may have these cutoffs, uh, uh, these uh, uh, intraluminal webs uh, on the left, highlighted in, in uh, yellow is an intraluminal web. Uh, those usually occur close to the branch points. Uh, you may also see eccentric thrombus, uh, pulmonary artery wall thickening, calcified thrombus within the uh, pulmonary arteries, uh, and variations in shape and size of the segmental arteries, all of which are, uh, can be associated with chronic pulmonary thromboembolic disease. The parenchyma, I think, is uh, very interesting because that's where a lot of the physiology occurs. But from an anatomic standpoint, especially from imaging, it, it should be uh, very homogeneous and clear, uh, but uh, and the pulmonary arteries and the adjacent bronchi should be normal, uh, similar in caliber. Uh, but uh, the parenchyma microscopically has extensive capillary surface, and that's where the physiology comes in because it, that uh, capillary surface is designed for gas exchange, and and because it's such a such a large. Um, uh, it's designed in that, that it's such a large, uh, it has a large capacitance uh, because of how it's designed and uh, low resistance. And so what's interesting is that it can handle very large changes in the cardiac output uh, with little change in the mean pulmonary arterial pressure. Uh, and the classic physiologic um, uh, model of lung perfusion is kind of a zonal model where uh, perfusion is heterogeneous uh, due to the effects of gravity. Uh, and another thing that I thought was interesting within the parenchyma itself is that uh, they estimate that you need about 50% of the vascular bed to be uh, obliterated before you have any significant change in the mean arterial pressure. Uh, so the design lung is designed to sort of uh, deal with the insults of uh, pulmonary embolism. And some of the parenchymal changes you can see uh, with uh, patients with uh, CTEF are sort of this mosaic pattern uh, of attenuation within the lung itself. It's not specific to CTEF, uh, but uh, it's uh, very common, uh, up to 77% of patients with CTEF. And so on the left, you'll see these sort of geographic areas of, uh, let's see if I can get the pointer to go over there. Uh, it did for a second. these geographic areas of dark and light within the actual lung parenchyma. And for uh, chronic uh, pulmonary embolism, 
it's the dark areas that are hypoperfused and the lighter areas are actually normal. As opposed to the example on this side, this is actually a patient with volume overload who has very similar sort of geographic pattern of uh, parenchymal opacification, but it's the, the wider areas that are actually abnormal because of overloaded fluid and the darker areas are normal for the, that patient. And uh, in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you may also see the similar pattern and that the darker areas are trapped, uh, lung uh, air trapping within the lungs. And so uh, some things you can do to tease these out if you don't know a lot of the history of the patient is uh, on inspiratory and expiratory images, um, the um, perfusion changes should be equivalent between the two as opposed to uh, if you're having air trapping, they'll be different uh, between inspiratory and expiratory images. Um, also, the air trapping can be uh, important, uh, or not, the, the mosaic pattern can be important for prognostic purposes in uh, CTEF patients specifically, and that if uh, some studies have shown that if the, the increased number of lobes that have uh, abnormal perfusion pattern uh, plus uh, normal segmental arteries is associated with a po higher post-operative uh, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, some more acute changes are the uh, uh, kind of a Hampton's hump sort of uh, infarct within the, the lung itself. And those sort of wedge-shaped densities can also uh, be seen in the chronic phases of uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, they can become more like parenchymal bands or scarring or cavities. Uh, but then also that too can be prognostic uh, from a physiologic standpoint because those patients with multiple peripheral densities with CTEF have a higher pre and post-operative PVR, suggesting that their disease is actually more distal than, uh, than other patients. Uh, pulmonary vascular resistance from a fluid uh, mechanic standpoint, I guess is it's the resistance you need to overcome in order to move blood through the pulmonary circuit, right? Uh, and so uh, the calculation is basically a change in pressure over the cardiac output. Uh, this calculation on the left is the, the hybrid relative unit or the Woods unit. Um, if you multiply that by 80, that's how you can get the dynes second per centimeter to the fifth. Uh, and it's used uh, to kind of uh, prognosticate uh, or stratify patients in the preoperative setting. Uh, if you have Woods units in the 11 to 15 range, your mortality is about 10%. Uh, but uh, lower than that, it's 4%. And higher than the 15, that's, uh, you have up 20% uh, or more mortality. And in the postoperative setting, if you can get the patients with a, a PVR of uh, around 6.25, that's a, a magic cutoff number. Because if it's less than 6.25, some studies have shown that your mortality is 0.9%, uh, whereas if it's over, it's about 30%. Um, to complete the circuit uh, quickly is that the pulmonary uh, blood returns through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, left ventricle, then the aorta. And uh, cardiac output, which I touched on a moment, you, two ways to sort of calculate the cardiac output for determining pulmonary vascular resistance, a thermodilution model where you inject saline and detect changes in pre uh, temperature to calculate what the uh, cardiac output is. And then a FIC method, which is uh, based off of oxygen consumption and uh, I left a, a table in the uh, uh, online content for your uh, perusal for uh, normal values. One last thing I wanna really touch on is the bronchial artery system. Uh, bronchial arteries can be present very commonly in CTEF patients, uh, and it also uh, can indicate that it's a, uh, can help with prognost uh, prognostic purposes and that uh, uh, preoperative pulmonary, uh, there's no correlation between bronchial artery and preoperative pulmonary artery pressures. However, those with the dilated bronchial arteries have lower postoperative PVR and uh, lower mortality uh, related to, uh, uh, if, if that's present. And so the dilated bronchial arteries are uh, uh, a sign that you may have more proximal disease, at least that's in theory. Um, future directions from an anatomic and physiologic perspective, I think things that we can do more with are dual energy CT where you can use, you use two different x-ray attenuations in order to provide perfusion maps of the lung, uh, gated CTA where you can look at uh, pulmonary artery distensibility and correlate that with uh, pulmonary artery pressure. Uh, MR, MRA, and then I th one other thing I think uh, for uh, the long-term future is molecular imaging of the pulmonary vasculature. There are some uh, studies mostly in animals now where you take PET or spec CT radio ligands to try to uh, evaluate the uh, pulmonary vascular remodeling in the setting of 
acute and chronic pulmonary thromboembolism. These are my references. Thank you.